And I just want to remind folks to continue keeping an eye out for our announcements here. We continue to have our in-person worship. We do have a plan in place um, for if we need to go back to online worship. So just keep your eye out for that. And we will continue to do our due diligence in working with our board and our um, reopen task committee to ensure that we are all together in this space as safely as possible. And if we need to go back online, we do have a plan. We gather today in hope. We gather today in a strange way than we are used to. The first Sunday of Advent might seem a little bit hollow, a little bit empty, and yet this morning I am filled with some hope in the sunshine. It really seems to be pouring in these windows this morning, and so I invite you to ground yourself here in this place and in the light, and we'll say together our call to worship. On this day, we celebrate the hope made known in the Advent season as we begin the journey towards the stable and a newborn king. Slow our busy minds that we can continue to be aware of those around us and their needs. As we watch the eastern sky for the first sign of night and we search the newspapers for a good news story, we are reminded of the story of a child born in a difficult time to bring hope. And we also remember people who are still in need of that same hope today, especially those in our world who are in need of warm clothing on cold nights, clean water to drink, and nourishing food to eat. We know this day that hope is coming, and so I invite us to open our hands to share the hope we hold in our hearts for all God's people this day. Let us invite the light of hope into our worship space now. light of hope is here. And Louise made it look so easy last year. I didn't know that little talk came off of the candle. <laughs> Thanks be to God for the light. And I'm going to invite us to remain seated as we sing our opening hymn, just humming, not singing, humming our first hymn, just one verse of Hope is a Star. Our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. The title of today's uh, story for Mission and Minutes for Mission is entitled Growing at Golden Lake Camp. Our gifts for mission and service make United Church Camp places where many lives are tr transformed. Let us hear from Amy, a young adult leader at Golden Lake Camp in the Upper Ottawa Valley. This year will be my second as program director for Golden Lake Camp and my fourth year in total. I started my GLC journey as a volunteer, spending two and a half weeks there my first summer. I could go into lots of detail about all the amazing things I experienced, the equally amazing staff and campers I met, the personal and spiritual growth I went through, and the deeper connection with God I, I fostered. But I don't think you want to hear an essay length story. In short, by the end of my time volunteering, I had been having so much fun that I didn't even remember to cash my honorarium check. The executive director, the one and only lovely Beth Payson, <coughs> told me the following summer when I applied for a permanent position how I had kind of messed up the budget that year by not cashing it. Whoops. Working at GLC literally and I don't use that word lightly, made my life better, and I've met some lifelong friends there. The atmosphere and love at this place are infectious, and you truly make a noticeable difference in children's lives. If mission and service giving is already a regular part of your life, thank you so much. If you have not given, please join me in making mission and service giving a regular part of your life of faith loving our neighbor as the heart of our mission and service. Please pray with me. Holy One, help us to hear the words and the encouragement of the scriptures that we may hold fast to the assurance of your love. This morning we turn to the book of Isaiah and we hear in chapter 40, verses 9 to 11. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might and with God rules for them. His reward is with him and his re recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd and gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. And in the Gospel according to St. Luke, in Zechariah's prophecy it is stated, Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who revile us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant. The oath that was sworn to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to God's people for the forgiveness of their sins by the tender mercy of our God. The dawn from on high will break upon us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. For the word of God 
among us for the word of God within us, for the word of God in Scripture. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You who are our strength and our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I wonder if in your lifetime you have ever had a recurring dream. I can't remember them in my adult years, but in my childhood years, I had this particular recurring dream about the Wizard of Oz. Often it's movies that capture our imagination. They say dreams are often what we interact with during the day and subconscious coming out in our dreams at night. But for me, I would have this recurring dream where I was Dorothy, except I looked like myself. I had the whole gingham dress and everything and the pigtails, but it was blonde hair. And there wasn't a yellow brick road that I followed along with the Scarecrow and the Tin Man and the Cowardly Lion, but a red cellophane road. And at the end of the road, we didn't end up at the Emerald City, but the North Pole, where I would get to sit on Santa's lap and tell him what I wanted for Christmas. I always ask for the same thing. I want to go home. Somehow that movie, maybe I watched it at Christmas time, my parents simply can't remember why I continued to have this dream. It was a thing when I was a kid, and they would ask, did you have the dream again? When I'd seen a little bit questioning in my look when I'd come out in the morning, yeah, I had the dream again, I don't know what it means. I probably should get it analyzed someday. I just know that until I was about 12 years old, I would have this dream, and for some reason, it's one of the only ones in my life that I can remember in detail. I've had other vivid dreams over the years, but I can only ever remember snippets of them when I wake up, and then they are completely forgotten by later that day. That's often what happens to us with our dreams. Or I don't remember the dream itself, but I wake up with a feeling of what the dream meant to me. I wake up either happy or fearful. I remember once waking up and laughing out loud, and I have no idea of what. But today, as we begin the season of Advent, we are going to be reading scriptures in this season that often speak about dreams, and specifically about God speaking to people in dreams. It's usually described as a vision. God appeared in a vision. God had a vision for the world, indeed, and we've already gone through all of that imagination and that vision when we looked at the Old Testament at the very first story of the Bible. God had a vision, a desire for a good and beautiful world. The vision that came to life in that story of creation, in a world that was full of plants and animals and rivers and oceans and people all living together in harmony. But we know the story changes very soon after it begins. Because very soon after humans were created, some of what God desired and dreamed and hoped for the world became corrupted. People became filled with a desire not for good, but a desire for power and a willingness to kill one another for it even. The desire to enslave or oppress people was a reality that began so long ago, and I would dare say it continues on today. We also know from the scriptures that the enslaved and oppressed people had something that was an amazing thing to have in those times of challenge and struggle against the powers that threatened to consume them, they had hope. Hope offered to them in the form of liberation. Those Israelites who left their prison in Egypt and began their wilderness journey towards a promised land where they could settle and begin anew. And their dreams of being settled into that promised land include a promised time when they wouldn't be torn apart by internal factions or ruled by corrupt people or dominated by stronger nations nearby. Desires and dreams and hopes inspire action. And Brian McLaren says that's what sets things apart from a wish. That's what sets desires and dreams and hopes apart from wishing, because wishing, according to McLaren, is a substitute for action. It creates a kind of passive op optimism that can paralyze people in a happy fog of complacency. 
Everything's going to be fine, so why work? Why struggle? Why sacrifice or plan? In contrast, I believe our desires and dreams and hopes for the future can actually be a guide for how we can act in the moment. Our prophets in the scriptures actually have quite a fascinating role as the ones who uphold the best kinds of hope and dream and vision for the world. The prophets of the Old Testament and indeed the New Testament challenge people to act in ways that are consistent with people behaving in good and hopeful ways. And people who are behaving in ways that are harmful get warned by these prophets of a future that will come to be if the poor behavior continues. Isaiah, we just heard from this morning, is one of the most prophetic voices of all the biblical narrative, and we actually focus quite a bit on Isaiah during the season of Advent. Isaiah's wisdom is often quoted by prophets of the New Testament. Jesus himself often quoted Isaiah. We know that Isaiah speaks of dreams and visions, and definitely of hope for a future by the actions that are taken in the present. Today we begin a journey of Advent, and I talked about in the Advent letter that went out this week to people about the fact, I believe, that most of us are feeling a little bit weary. And when we think about beginning a journey, even though it's a hypothetical journey, we feel a little bit weary of taking even the first step because we are tired and we are weighed down. Life has been turned upside down. It's been thrown into chaos by what we get related to us from the media. We don't know what to think or what to do next these days. And today feels a little bit like we are still feeling fear and uncertainty, and for lots of people, deep sadness. It's the exact opposite of what we're supposed to be feeling in this time of year, isn't it? But I want to give you permission, because that's okay. It's okay to be tired. It's okay to lament that our family dinner tables and our holiday activities aren't happening the same way we're used to or the vision that we had for them. And it's perfectly acceptable to feel tired, to feel weary, downright exhausted. All of that is okay, because that's what the last nine months have brought to us, and yet, hope remains. A little later on in Isaiah, it is proclaimed for us, a root shall come out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf, and the lion, and the fatling all together, and a little child shall lead them. It's one of my favorite lines in all of scripture, and a little child shall lead them. We begin a journey today. Jesus is about to be born, a new hope for all of the world, and today marks the beginning of our yearly reminder to hold on to that hope, that desire, and that dream for the little babe who grew into the most amazing man, the one who would go on to live a life that continues to be our example of how to live in the moment, how to be a person who not just wishes things would happen, but actually makes them happen. Today's Gospel reading in Luke reminds us, A new child will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to God's people by the forgiveness of their sins, by the tender mercy of our God, that dawn from on high will break upon us. And perhaps my favorite line of all, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. For me, that speaks of a hope that is greater than all that we can imagine as we feel as though we sit in darkness sometimes. In your bulletin inserts this morning, and for those who are going to uh, be watching this later, it will be included in the PowerPoint, there's an insert highlighting the efforts of this very congregation and the hard work of making a hope, a dream, and a desire become a reality for the Lou family. 
Back in October, when I was chatting with Velda Cochran, she talked about the important work that St. Paul's United Church had and she and Bruce were heavily involved in as they led a team of people committed to sponsoring this family who was seeking refuge from their home country of Vietnam. Some of you might remember that time. Some of you may have been involved in that important work. I've listened to the stories of many people who are considered to be refugees over the years. My own home congregation has also been sponsoring families since 1979. And while each story and each journey is unique to the family or to the person and the circumstances to which they come from, I find a common purpose and a thread is weaved through all of those stories. Each of those people seeking refuge are seeking a better and safer life for themselves and for their family. They're seeking to live in a place that's free of oppression or violence. I was particularly touched when I read Velda's reflection and the words of Han Lu when he wrote to St. Paul's back in 1990 to say, at no point in time will we, we be able to repay you for your generosity, all of your support and encouragement. And by the words of his granddaughter Leanne, who said, we wouldn't be where we are now without St. Paul's United Church and all of the wonderful volunteers. And for Bruce and Velda's closing line to that reflection about this sponsorship. The resilient journey between that nervous arrival in 1980 to where they are today is one that is to be celebrated. That's a story of hope. Hope made known from the people of this community. And it's a wonderful testament to the people of this place who took action in the moment to help the dreams and desires of another become a reality. Advent is a journey that we are called to take, and in the centuries between the time of the prophets and the birth of Jesus, the prophetic dreams of those who longed for more, they never died, but they were never necessarily completely fulfilled either. Such is life as it continues today, and yet through stories like the journey of the Lou family, we are reminded that hope remains and can be lived out in amazing and unexpected ways, that the lives that we touch continue to have a ripple effect out into different generations. You know, we have some pictures up here. Smiling, beautiful generations of faces. In every time and every season, there is indeed opportunity for us to see and experience God's presence in our lives and in the world around us. In every time and every season, there's a moment in which God calls us to be part of what God is doing in the world. And in every time and every season, there is a danger that we'll become weighed down and distracted by the busyness of life or the hardships that we face. And so, in this season of Advent, as we face one of the biggest challenges of my lifetime, I can't speak for everybody else's lifetime, but I pray that we'd be extra alert to the things that weigh us down to the things that might keep us from experiencing the desires and the visions and the dreams that God has for our world. Because they continue on even in the midst of a pandemic, my friends. In the season of Advent, I pray that we would be assured that God is inviting each and every one of us to continue to live fully into the time that God is offering us right here, right now. We, we be assured of that hope and that promise that God made so long ago in the form of a little babe. Hope born into this world that lives on still today. And so, let us dare to dream in the face of this pandemic and may this candle of hope, it's a small flame with a big illumination. And we pray that this candle lit today will illuminate the voices of those prophets who proclaimed God's hope for all the world so many years ago. Let that flame keep glowing strong in our hearts this day and always as we begin a journey together. Thanks be to God.
brothers and sisters around in this huge world whom we are connected to. We pray for places where there is violence, where there is political upheaval, where there is fear and doubt. We pray for your light to shine into the darkness, to illuminate our faith that we may continue to be called to action in your world. We pray for you to continue to inspire us, to offer us hopes and visions and desires for our Amen. Mm-hmm. 